Amen, amen. Hey, if you got your Bible, if you'll go over to the Gospel of Luke chapter two, we'll be there in just a moment. We're gonna be a few places today as uh, this morning is a little bit different than a typical Sunday morning message in that I'm gonna be sharing from my heart a little bit about the vision of where God's calling us as a church. How many know vision is important, whether it's in your personal life or whether it's in your organization that you lead, your business that you lead, whether it's in your family to have a vision for your home, but especially for us as a church family, it's important for us to make sure that we follow the vision that God has for us as a people. What I love about it is this, is there are different kinds of churches in Shelbyville, Tennessee. There's different churches in this region. And the reality is each of us have unique vision in the sense that there are specific things we're called to do and who we're called to be that maybe is different, but it complements each other. I mean, no, we're not competing with other churches. Like we're not in this ecclesiastical cold war where we're trying to be like, my kid's church is better than your kid's church and our music's better than your music. That's, that's the competitive spirit of corporate America that can infiltrate the church and get us away from being a sacred people to becoming very secularistic in our, in our mindset. And I don't want us to do that. I want us to, to understand maybe they're different. Maybe, maybe they've got robes and chants and hey, that's cool. Like go with that. Maybe they sang Southern gospel this morning, man, just, they had a great time. Maybe it was a choir, beautiful. Maybe they had candles lit, great. Maybe they're like us and there's laser beams shooting across the sky and that's fantastic. But the reality is we, we always want to do what we do to honor Jesus and to try to, to be faithful in what he's calling us to do because each of us will reach people that other churches can't. There's people that will come to Gateway and find home that wouldn't find it at First Baptist. There's people at First Baptist that will find home that wouldn't find it at Gateway. And so for us to understand that it's okay for us to run the race God has called us to run because there's a harvest that he's called us to reach that no one else is called to reach. And so understanding that, I want us to understand the importance of, of vision. And so let's just pray and we'll get right into this. Lord, I love you so much. Thank you for being so kind and so good. I pray that today, Lord, that you would let Jason fade into the background and Jesus, you would take center stage. Please speak through me, Lord, and allow your words to transform all of us. If what I say is from you, let it find good ground. But if what I say is, is not of you, anything I say that's in my flesh or a mistake or an error, I pray, God, that you guard the people's hearts. I love you, and I thank you today in Jesus' name. Everybody says amen and amen. So vision is not new. I think sometimes we think the idea and the sense of vision is something that came about with a great leadership book. You know, maybe we thought it was something that came about in the 20th century with the rise of the focus on leadership. Maybe we thought John Maxwell came up with the idea of vision. But in reality, vision is ancient. And when you look in the ancient text of scripture, you find that it tells us that where there is no vision, people perish. Um, another translation says it this way, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. And, and what that means is people will not move in a focused, intentional direction without vision. They cast off restraint. They'll just be wayward people. And and I think that's true for all of us in our individual lives. It's true for us in our, like I said, our organizations. It's definitely true for us in church. And so today I want to talk to you about vision. And I want to talk to you specifically about the vision God has for us. And to understand that this is something that, that this is not me unpacking all, this is not a, 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 a me unpacking all the ministries we have. This is not a, a, you know, an infomercial for Gateway Church. More this is me trying to share the heart of what God is sharing with us of who he's calling us to be, to, to try to paint a picture of a preferred future that I feel like the Lord has for us. And so understanding that, I think we, we've got to begin not just talking about vision, but I think that where there is no vision, people perish, but where there is no memories, people have no gratitude. So to start talking about the future, I first want us to go back to the past. I want to show you a picture of some of the, the first groups of people that made Gateway Church who we are today. And, and you can see the different photos here. This is Gateway Church through the years and the different places and the different locations and the different families. And uh, some of you may not know this. Someone asked me, when did you plant your church? Like we didn't plant Gate Gateway Church. This year turns 84 years old, this December 10th. And uh, she looks good to be 80, 83, 84 years old. And so, 
we're very thankful for that God's been with us throughout the, this time and throughout the years. And, but I want us to understand this. Everything that we're getting to do today is on the shoulders of those who come before us. Like, like there were prayer warriors in the, in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s, and they sold chicken dinners to keep the, the church building open during some seasons. And, and we're here today because of faithful generations before us were walking out the vision that God gave them for the season they were in. So understand this, we're standing here today, but there are, there are generations coming after us. There are sons and daughters coming after us that are gonna be able to stand in a place of great harvest because of our faithfulness in this season to follow the Lord and what he's calling us to do. So we're thankful for them. We're thankful for, for people like Gigi Glover, uh, some don't know who Gigi Glover is, and Gigi Glover was a builder back then. He and his family were a part of the church, and they helped build the old building next door uh, that we were in when I first arrived here. And, and speaking of that building, let me show you a photo of what church was like. You see that blue carpet, y'all? Like, I felt like Jesus walking on water every Sunday. Yeah, Rory has a degree in interior design, and uh, is that color work with schemes and stuff, or no? Okay. Well, well, that, that bright ocean blue carpet was there, and it was, uh, but you know what? We had church, and I don't know if you can see the pews. The, the chairs didn't even match colors, and we had those tan chairs when I arrived, and, and we started growing, so the Lord said, it's time to make room, and that's the theme of today's vision talk. Leave that, that photo up just for a second. But the, the, the theme for the vision is make room. And we had to make room in that old building. So those, those chairs you see, the black ones, were actually black with gold polka dots on them. And uh, you can take the photo down. But, but what I want us to get with this is like, we outgrew the seats we had. We were so broke, we had like $8,000 in the bank. We were so broke, but we had to make room. And so I called around to different chair companies and I was like, do you have any chairs? And we sell them at a discounted rate. And like, we don't have a lot of money, but we need it. We got people coming in, the church is growing and we need this. And, and, and so I finally got in touch with this one chair company in Georgia. And I told them, I said, we just need chairs. They was like, well, we got some, nobody wants to buy them. I said, why? I said, they're ugly. <laughs> I said, we'll take them. And so I went over, I rode over with my mom and we went over and, and uh, just outside Atlanta and we got over there and, and we're like, How, we'll buy some of these chairs and we got them and they, we got somebody to go get them in a U-Haul and we brought them back over there and we put them in. They were, they're like, pastor, what are you doing? I was like, I was like, well, those are tan. These are black, but that gold kind of looks tan if you look at it in just the right lighting. So it kind of ties it all together, right? Interior decorating is not my thing. And so, so anyway, but we, we bought those chairs, and guess what? The Lord packed out that place. Let, let me show you another photo, that, that one. We, we got new carpet. I don't know if you see the carpet we got over there, but it wasn't blue anymore. And we added those chairs, and he packed out the place. God started sending a harvest because we made room for other people to come into his house of worship. We went to multiple services there. And, and then the Lord said, I've got something else for you. Let me show you the photo. When we launched in here, we launched in here to, a, to a, I didn't know if anybody was gonna come, how it was gonna be, like, like we packed it out and went to multiple services after that. Like God has been so faithful to us if we would just make room for what he's wanting to do in our life and in our church. Can we praise him for what he's already done? He's been so incredibly faithful. And so I wanna just begin unpacking this because when you, when you look at Jesus, the life of Jesus was, was Jesus, and the ministry of Jesus was he consistently made room for people. He consistently made room for people. He, he made room for sinners, and he made room for religious people, and he made room for, for all different types of people, different ethnicity kind of people, different background kind of people, different kind of flavors of sin. I mean, some, some of us, we got an issue. We accept some flavors of sin and not other flavors of sin, but can I tell you, all sin separates you from God. And so he, he was very intentional to make room. So as I was leading into to Vision Sunday, I said, God, like, you know, I, I wish you would give me, like, I see these guys who have, like, these vision statements, and they're, like, so cool and so clever, and it, it's, like, double for your trouble, and, like, all, it rhymes all the time. And so it, it's, it's all, I don't have that. I got a simple statement, make room. The Lord just spoke to my heart, said, make room. So the first thing I want to talk about for us as a church as we lean forward in this next season is making room for God. 
Like, like we, we've got to make room for the Lord. Look what it says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 says, Joseph also, now this is, I know as I read this, you're going to think this is like a Christmas verse, and it kind of is, and Christmas is already on the way. How many know it's okay to go ahead and have your Christmas tree up right now? Amen? Some, some of y'all are like, I ain't feeling that, Pastor. Like, <laughs> I don't feel good. Like, like I think I, I'm all ready for Christmas. So Joseph also went out from Galilee to the city of Nazareth and Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. It says, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, or his engaged wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. It says, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So, so imagine this. They show up at Motel 6, all right? And they're like, the savior of the world's about to be born. Can we have a room? And they're like, well, we don't have any room. And you think, well, I can't believe that. Like, like how could someone not have room to Jesus? How, how can they leave Jesus on the outside? But yet you go to the book of Revelation and you see Jesus knocking on the door of the church, asking them to let him in. So how many times do we, do we have churches that gather and, and, and listen, I appreciate all that we do, and, and, and I'm thankful for our music. It's so great. How many thankful for the skilled musicians that, that use their skill for the glory of God? And, and I'm grateful for these screens, and I'm thankful for this screen, and I'm thankful for you, and I'm thankful for this building. But, but can I be honest with you? If all we do is come and sing songs and, and enjoy the atmosphere and drink a great coffee in the lobby, but Jesus isn't here, we are wasting our time. Like, like we have to be intentional as a people to make room for the Lord in this place and in our lives. And so we see that making room is something that comes with intentionality, but I also want us to understand this. I want us to understand for us as we move forward, there, there's a reason that we have worship nights, which by the way, it's not on the 12th, it's on the 8th. It's on a Wednesday night. We're having an encounter night here. And so we have that coming up, and you say, well, what's that about? Why is it called encounter? That sounds so, like, spiritual. Because we want to encounter the Lord. Like, let's just call it what it is. Like, we want to encounter his presence, his goodness, his grace. And so we want to show up and just go after him. But that takes us pursuing him. It takes us leaning into him. And it takes us being intentional about what it looks like. For instance, we want to be a church of encounter, a church where his spirit moves freely and does what his spirit wants to do. But, but it means for us, it means that we, we, yes, we see the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation, but, but operating with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What I mean by that is, is a mature spirituality. That, that we, we are not just caught up in emotionalism, but we're also not, we're not without emotion. Like we're not afraid to show our emotion, but, but we're not yet, we're not into emotionalism. And, and you say, well, what's the difference? Is the difference to me is emotionalism is when you, your motivation is to move people. But yet, sincere, authentic worship is when you worship because he's worthy. So, so, so get this, it is not about I'm gonna sing the song and I'm gonna hit the bridge and we're gonna drop a chord because I know when we drop a chord then people get goosebumps. When people get goosebumps then they start getting excited and when this person gets excited, that person gets excited and we all get excited and like, like that, I get that. You get that at Morgan Wallen, okay? What I'm talking about is, is making sure we give room to the sincere, authentic presence of God to do what only the presence of God can do in our midst. That we worship and we pray and we pursue and we give room. There was people in the altar this morning during worship that were weeping and praying and, and there's some churches that were like, hey, they, we're too dignified for that. This is awkward. This is, this is out of order. Can I tell you, God saving someone, God delivering someone, God redeeming someone, God, God restoring someone is never out of order. So we, we, want, we want to make room we want to make sure there's room for the rhema words. Those, those, rhema is a Greek word for the word, word in the word. And, and, it's, and it's describing an inspired utterance of the word. It's, it's, a, it's a moment where you speak the word. It's different than logos. 
Logos is the written expressed word. And, and so sometimes I think we get these confused, but did you know what it says? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say Logos there. It says Rhema. Because when you hear a rhema, it's an in-season, right-now word that, that is being produced from the Logos, spoken, lining up with the Logos, with the Word of God, but that speaks into your season and where you are. For instance, if you're struggling with sickness in your body, it doesn't inspire you very much. If I, if I, if I quote to you that Judas went out and hung himself, do you get faith because of that? No. But yet if I quote to you that he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we've already been healed. All of a sudden you start saying, well maybe that's for me and it says that in the Bible, that, that's, that's a word. It's an in season right now where what, maybe you're struggling with dep depression. Like, and maybe I quote to you where it says, he will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. Or, or I quote to you that, that his joy will be your strength. Then all of a sudden you say, maybe, maybe that's for me. So we wanna have the rhema spoken word, but we also want to make sure that we are lining up with the Logos. To make sure that we study the word and we lean into the word, that we wanna be a church of worship and a church of the word. And I don't know where, where along the way, like we had to pick one or the other. Like you ever notice, like you go to some, like I, I would go to church and be like, oh man, the worship's great here. And then, then it's like, okay, the, the, well, the, the word, that was not even in the Bible. What are they talking about? Or then I'll go someplace and I'm like, man, that's really good doctrine. And it was like as dry as cracker juice in the worship. It was, it was, it was like God's frozen chosen, like just, just, just. No thankfulness, no gratitude, no worship, no praise. And you say, well, why do you have to praise that way? It's the way he asks us to praise is to worship him in spirit and in truth and to worship him. So we want to be a church of breath and bones, his spirit, but also his structure. And we want to make sure that we steward what he places in our hands really well. If I could sum it up, I would say it this way. We want authentic worship and authentic experiences with God. And now this is, this is the challenge, is imagine that authenticity is this line. This is, this is authenticity, okay? I think sometimes we allow authenticity and our search for authenticity to become a lid for our pursuit of the Lord. So, so we think, well, well, I don't wanna do that. I don't know if that feels authentic. I, I, don't, I don't know if I wanna do that. I, I don't know if, I, well, is this real? Like you can get into circular reasoning. Like sometimes I'll say this, I'll be like, God, I'm throwing up my hands to worship you. Well, God, why am I throwing up my hands around? Is it because people are in this church and they see me and I'm the pastor and they want to see me worshiping? Or am I, am I really worshiping you because I really worship you? Well, well, my hands are up right now, God. Is this sincere? Like, like but am I asking this question because I want you to think it's sincere and I want them to think I'm sincere, but am I sincere? Like, like you get into all of this stuff. I, I've just come to the point, I'm like, God, I am a broken, weak, frail man that is utterly dependent on you, but I lift up my hands, all of my heart that's right and all of my heart that's even wrong, I give it to you. I give you my good, I give you my bad, and I say, God, do what only you can with it. Change my heart, make me like you, mold me into your image, let me be more like Jesus. And I think that that authentic place should not be a lid to our pursuit, but it should be a launching pad for our pursuit of the Lord. Authenticity is a starting place for us. God, I'm coming to you exactly as I am, knowing I need you. And my prayer is that we as a church moving forward, I mean, I'm, just, I'm, I'm gonna like take off the polished talk right now and just get very transparent with you guys. I grew up around a lot of hype in church. And we knew how to have church. We knew how to move the room and manipulate the atmosphere. You know, you would hit certain chords and it would do it. You would say a certain thing. There's certain things you can say to elicit responses. And one day it, it, it hit me that I, I felt this feeling like, well, this, this service is kind of dead. I need to go stir it up. And I thought, huh, I don't want to manufacture anything, but I do want manifestation. 
So, so this is the thing. The reason I don't wanna manufacture is this, think about this. I don't wanna be a church that markets miracles. Let me tell you why. This is a business. Whatever you market, you have to manufacture. And, and if I market miracles, it won't be long before I'm stretching truths to try to make it look like miracles. I, listen, I, I don't care to get on TV. I'm not writing a best-selling book yet. I'm joking. But like, I'm kidding. Like, like, none of that. Like, what I want is this. It, there's no angle but the angle of I know there are people that are living in this world that are honest and sincere and have questions, and whether we like it or not, have seen a misrepresentation of Jesus through the church, and we have a responsibility to humble ourselves, to repent of our sins, to repent of our arrogance, to repent of our pride, to re repent of our hate, and we have the responsibility of being a witness of Christ, and that means that I just want him to show up and do what only he can do and whatever that looks like. If it's healing, heal them, God. If it's be with us through the hardship, be with us through the hardship. If it's, if it's you did the miracle we asked, praise you, we'll worship you for it, or if it's you let me endure the dark night of my soul and walk through the, the valley with me, then God, I praise you for being with me every single step of the way. Way, but either way, at the end of the day, I want to give him glory. If you thank God and believe that, would you give him praise? So I want to make room for him. That means for us to make room for him in our lives, to make room in our lives. Let, let, let me say this, and I'm preaching to the choir, but, but let me say this. Your children will not embrace the values that you explain they will embrace the values that you embody. So, so, so if you are at home and you tell them, hey, you read your Bible. Hey, you, are, you, are, you, are you walking with God? Like, hey, God's the most important thing. But they don't see the reflection of God being the most important thing in your life. They won't embrace that value. What we do is we start multiplying lukewarmness and hypocrisy. Unintentionally sometimes. It's like Jesus talking to the Pharisees. He says, it says, you make your children twice the devil's you are. And there has been seasons in my life where my children were on that path because of some things I had to change in my life and the way I did things. And so for all of us, I think we can look in the mirror and say, like, God, there's no shame. That's not what we're doing here. But God, how can I better reflect you? How can I make sure that we're passing this on to future? How can I make room for you in my life? And, and this is the thing is I remember one time one of my sons, I made him get up to come to church. And, and, and I, won't, I won't out Trevin when I say this, but, um, but he said, he was like, oh, I just wanna stay home. And I was like, well, we gotta go to church, bud. And he was like, oh, I, I, I said, I wish my dad wasn't the pastor. I said, hey, I need to tell you something. And he was young, I mean, he was probably 15. Um, and he was, I remember I, I, he said, it was, I, I wish my dad wasn't the pastor. And I remember saying to him, son, I'm not making you go to church because you're the pastor's kid. I'm making you go to church because you're my kid. And, and I want you to go. And, and you say, well, well, I shouldn't make my child go. Like, I want them to make the decision on their children. Like, we, we, we need to lead them in paths of righteousness. Like, you don't ask them, like, well, well son, do you feel like going to the doctor? I, I know, like, it's your choice. And, like, but no, you go because they need to see a physician. But can I tell you, more so than they need to see a physician for their body, they need to see a physician for their souls. And they need to know Jesus. And, and they need to know the house of the Lord. And they will, they will actually appreciate. I went to church my whole childhood. And my whole teen years, even when I tried, I couldn't be a good sinner. I tried to be a good sinner. I tried, and it was like I'd be laying there. I'd be like drunk laying there going, God, please don't come back tonight. 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 Like the fear of the Lord in my heart. But I'm thankful for that. So let's make room for the Lord. We've got to make room for people. We've got to make room for people moving forward. And this is the thing. In Mark chapter two, verses one through five, there's this incredible story where Jesus is preaching the word of God and he's doing all kinds of miracles. And it says, again, he entered Capernaum after some days and it was heard that he was in the house. How many know we make room for Jesus? We want him in the house, amen? Immediately, many gathered together. 
So let's just leave that verse there. Notice when we make room for Jesus in the house, many gather together. The greatest church growth principle I can give you, the reason that we started with 40 people in an old building next door with bright ocean blue carpet and God has brought us here in this season is because we made room for Jesus. And when we made room for Jesus, many gathered together. So that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. It says, and when they could not come near to him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. So a couple of things with this story that I feel like connects with where we are. Number one is there's a season that we always have to make room. And, and, and this is the thing is we're, we're at two services now. Uh, the last, I don't know, three months, we've averaged between 1,000 to 1,200 people, okay, on a Sunday. And the reality is we are hitting our capacity. We're hitting our capacity. And, and you say, what's capacity? Capacity is about 80% of what a room holds. And obviously there's some Sundays that's up, some Sundays that are down, but, but for us to go where God's calling us, we've got to be intentional to make room. So these are things that we're looking at. How can we make room to continue to reach people for Christ? We're gonna talk about that in just a second. The other thing we see is that, that this man that could not help himself had his friends carry him in there. And, and this is the thing, if you, wanna, if you wanna know how you can make a difference, be a bringer. Be somebody that brings people that maybe don't even know they need it into the house of God to hear the gospel, to encounter God's presence. Like, like we are, listen, we're not gonna impress people with, with uh, maybe how we do things, but what will change their life is them encountering Jesus and hearing the gospel, and that's what we want. So, so be a bringer. They brought this man in. And do it with faith. Notice as Jesus saw their faith, forgave his sins, and healed the man. That's powerful. And so for us, we want to be a place of healing for people, but that means we've got to make room. We've got to make room for people that don't look like us. We've got to make room for people that don't think like us. We, we've got to make room for people that actually disagree with us. We've got to make room for people we don't like. You've got to make room for your ex. If they want to come to the house of God, somebody says, I'll go to the 11 o'clock service if that happens. <laughs> but like, like we've got to make room for people because listen, we have such a short time in this thing called life and eternity is forever. And what we do now ripples into eternity and I pray that we can get past our own emotions or our offenses or, or, or even our hate or even our bigotry to say this is a place where anyone can come and be loved and hear the gospel and know Jesus. Like, like, like I know, there, there's, listen, we can't let culture wars get in the way of the witness Jesus is calling us to. That, that means that no matter what your sexuality that you come in this place, you are welcome to come here because this is what I know. The Holy Spirit with all of us meets us where we are and he changes our life. And if we're all being honest, most people in this room had some level of, 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 of disorder or some level of sickness even when it comes to your own soul, even when it comes to your own sexuality. There are things that we have all done to fall short of the glory of God. But if we can receive the grace and mercy of Jesus, how much more should we love people radically that need the grace and the love of Jesus? He met us where we were. So we've got to meet people where they are. And we've got to love them well. And we've got to welcome them well. And we've got to be patient that the Lord is working in the process. You know, I heard someone told me they were like, Pastor, I'm concerned. What you concerned about? I hear that all the time. It's like, I hear it a lot, and it makes me nervous every time I hear it. Pastor, I'm concerned. Huh, what are you concerned about? I'm concerned that we have so many sinners coming. I was waiting for him to say, I'm just kidding. They were serious. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Well, I'm concerned that our church enables them to live that way. Like, huh, when have you heard me get up and say it's okay? Well, I haven't heard that. Well, when have you heard me say that certain things are not okay? Well, I've heard you say that. Huh, have you seen people's lives get changed? Well, yeah. <laughs> you 
You know, God is so patient with our sin and our stupidity. <laughs> Thanks be unto God. And I'm like, I want every sinner in Middle Tennessee to be like, I'm going to Gateway next Sunday because you have a seat, you have a place, we've made room for you, and this is what I know. You will hear the gospel, you will be loved by people, and you will see lives transformed. That's what it's about. That's the gospel. We've got to make room. If you're willing to make room, can you give him praise this morning? But also making room looks like sometimes meeting people where they are. Notice Jesus always met people where they were. He's in the marketplace. Jesus would, would go and he would, he would you know, be in a field and just met farmers where they were, met, met the people in the city where they were, met the religious where they were. Like he always met people where they were. And what I love about it is we're getting to do that. One of the places that people are today is they are in, they're on their phones. This is no better way to say it. And I would say many people live on their phones. I'm not saying I am living on my phone. I pay rent there, but it's like, <laughs> but like they're on their phone all the time. And so if that's where people are, back in the day it was on television. That's why everybody was trying to get on TV. People are on their phones now. And that means if you want to impact people, you got to go where they are. So, so last year, a couple years ago, we said, we want to make our media ministry better. Let's, let's try to do this. And all of a sudden, we started seeing some increase in attention and things that were happening. And so since 2020, I want to show you the impact of Gateway's media ministry of people. Listen, this is not just YouTube. This is not just Facebook. This is people that have actually went the next step and went all the way to our website to intentionally look for us to follow up. This is not just accidental views. This is people intentionally watching. These are the nations of the world. The one in uh, Israel was actually, there was one in Ramallah um, that, that actually watches frequently, like connects intentionally with us. Uh, we have watch parties in Canada, Manitoba, our Manitoba crew is watching right now. Like they, they gather, they're in a rural area and they gather in homes and they watch our, our services and they worship with us. And so like we have people like literally like all over the world that is, this, this is the thing is media ministry amplifies. It doesn't give you a voice. It amplifies your voice. And so we've been able to do this, and, and this is an incredible thing. Let me show you. How, how, don't, don't put the MSW stuff up yet. I'll put it up in just a second. But how many know God blessed us with a great group of musicians, and not just musicians, worshipers, that, that not, only, they not only sing, but they write the music. And the Lord sent them here. The Lord gave, spoke to me years ago, says, I'm, I'm going to raise up a worship movement here. And I was like, okay, Lord, um, I don't play an instrument. I can't sing. Like... You're gonna to have to do it. And God just started miraculously sending people that felt called to move here. No job waiting for them. Moved here, got jobs because God called them here. Harley, who's our worship pastor, came here, worked for almost two years at a staffing agency, even though he's incredibly talented, had job offers everywhere else because the Lord told him to leave Mobile, Alabama, to move to Shelbyville, Tennessee, because that's where he had called him to come. So, so like, there's others. I could tell stories of others, but God called them to do that. And the vision was this, let's, that, that songs will be written from the local church for the local church to be able to glorify God. That, that it's not just an industry thing, it's not just done in Nashville or some other place, that, that it's from a local church. And, and when they write these songs, you're on their mind. What you're walking through, what you're facing, what you're overcoming, what God's doing in your life, that's the, the, the catalyst for when they write the songs. And, and so it was just kind of a, a hope and a dream. And uh, you know, we weren't trying to be like the next Hill song or the next Elevation or the next Bethel. We just wanted to be us and, and put songs out that glorified Jesus. And so we started doing that and said, like, God, what can you do? And let me show you the statistics of what God's done with Madison Street. This is on Apple, YouTube, Pandora, on Spotify, Amazon Music. Uh, total listeners in 177 nations of the world. Total streams views on the platform, 28,721,011 times. People have substantially listened. Uh, again, again, even when you, when you look at these, 60 million on Spotify, um, within the last year, 408,000 listeners. Like 408,000 people that took time to worship Jesus 
with music that's coming from Shelbyville, Tennessee. And, and you say, well, man, that, that must be great. Now, you guys must be rolling in the money. Can I tell you there's no money in music? Like, like, we're, like, like it's an investment. Like, it's not back in the day where you would buy CDs. I remember going to, like, sound shop to buy a CD, and that's how you listen to it. Then we got Napster. Anybody remember Napster. And we started pirating everything. I probably had to pray a lot for all the sins of the songs I stole in the late 90s, early 2000s. But like we started doing, started burning CDs and all of that kind of stuff. So like all the, the streaming stuff is where it's at and there's no money in that. So money is not the motivation. Ministry is the motivation. Songs that glorify God is the motivation. So, so we're leaning into this next season and you say, well, well what does it look like? We're, we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be raising funds to do a media suite so that we can do more Bible study content, so that we can do more online content, so that we can do more recordings for music and not have to outsource it and pay through the nose somewhere else to do it, so that we can do all of this stuff and how, so our goal, our phase one goal of where God's taken us is to raise $75,000 to do that, which is incredible. It's gonna save us money, but cause a ministry impact that goes far beyond Shelbyville, Tennessee. How many's thankful for what God has already done, amen? The, next, the second phase of making room for people is not only phase one of the media and all of that, but phase two is building expansion. And, and this is something we came into this place knowing that this was gonna be a limited time we could be able to, to be in this sanctuary because of the Lord giving the vision of where he was taking us. Uh, we still have about 40,000 square feet that's currently being used for gateway uh, outreach. And so that place was the future home of our sanctuary. We're getting ready to build that future sanctuary. Like we feel the Lord saying, like it's time to go, it's time to run, it's time to build. Like that season is here because I have a harvest for you. Let me say this for anyone listening, that does not mean gateway outreach is going away. We are going to always make room for gateway outreach that, that feeds around four or 500 people every weekend. Can we thank God for those who serve in that ministry? But we've got to make room. That, that means we could do that. We could expand and we could be able to go. Because what, what we're looking at in the near future is adding a third service. And adding a third service makes room for more people. But to be honest with you, a third service isn't very sustainable long term because it burns out people who are serving and it burns out the people who are making a difference and, and doing ministry in this church. So we want to make sure we have a long term goal that's able to make room for more people. And then the next phase is we're going to plant life giving, kingdom expanding churches around this region as the Lord directs us and calls us to do it. Like, how many know God's raising up church planners and raising up teams for regions and areas. So we're going to make room for people. We're going to be intentional to make room for people. And, and the reason is this is like, I, I don't have it wired within me. And, and someone actually, um, I was talking with another pastor and, and he told me, he says like, you know, Jason, why are you going to do that? Like you guys just got in the place where you are. Like, like you don't have to, you don't have to stress. You don't have to do all that. Like I didn't do this to have a career. I did this because it's a calling. And the calling is to reach souls and to change lives and to populate heaven while plundering hell. And so whatever we've got to do to do that, we're going to do that because we are in a shared mission that Jesus has given us to make disciples of people, not just converts, but disciples that follow after Christ. And we're going to do that together. The third thing is we're going to make room for people's callings. That goes hand in hand. We're gonna, we're gonna launch people out to plant other churches, but we're also gonna see them rise up in this church. And the story I thought about with this when, when the, I was just unpacking this was the story of Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas means son of encouragement. You can see this in Acts 4.36. It says, and Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. But look what happens in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse number 26, it says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. This is, Saul would later become Paul, as most of us know. But when he first got converted, this was a religious Jew that was persecuting the church. It says, He tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Verse 27, it says, But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. What, what am I saying here? Barnabas made room, for him, made room for his gift. Barnabas made room for Paul. Barnabas made room for somebody nobody else wanted to make room for. Barnabas was an advocate for him. 
And, and I guess this, this is the thing, is Barnabas saw the gifts in him and started declaring what he had done as he preached in Damascus. And this is what we would later find out is that later as history unfolds, you see that Paul, the one that they made room for, ended up being the most prolific author in the New Testament used by the Holy Spirit to write all those epistles. So imagine this, if they had not made room for Paul, we wouldn't have Romans. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. All of these great books in scripture, I'm sure the Lord could have used someone else, but, but the reality is Barnabas made room. And what we want to be as a church is a church that doesn't just have a select few of staff members that do ministry. My job is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That means that we're rolling out a more detailed and expanded internship program over the next couple of years. That means we're going to have leadership training for those that say, I want to make a difference in ministry training. Like, it means we're going to be able to, to expand to the next step of missions to go in beyond just local missions to foreign missions and, and making sure that we're reaching our global audience that God has called us to reach. So when we see this, we see that making room for other people's gifts, it really comes down to what Barnabas' name meant. It means son of encouragement. The word encouragement in the Greek is the word parakaleo. Para, like alongside, kaleo, to call out. And so literally, when you encourage someone, you call out the gifts that are within them. You speak something, you see and identify something in their life, and you call it out to the surface and call them alongside you in mission. You ever, you ever notice that when someone encouraged you about something, they said, hey, you're really good at this. All of a sudden, you're like, I can do this. I remember for me in, in, in middle school, it was, I had a high school or a middle school basketball coach. He says, you have the purest shot I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. Can I start? No, you can't dribble. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so I was like, this is cool. Like, uh, that was great. So I went into high school thinking I'm the greatest shooter. I, I, I was like, I am Steph Curry before Steph Curry. And so then he put me on the bench because I tried shooting just past half court. He was like, you ain't got that good of a shot. But I had confidence. You ever notice just one encouraging word can transform it to where you think, I can actually do this? Like, like I can overcome this? I remember as a dad, somebody said, hey, you're such a good dad. I felt like, oh man, that, that means the world to me. And when we speak life into each other, it's why our vision at this church is to be a life-giving, kingdom-expanding regional church with a global reach. That, that's what we're called to be. And that's what we try to like, like. We have people, raise your hand if you're not from Shelbyville, but you're here. Like, like, again, regional church. That's where God has called us with a global impact. And, and so, but to do that, we've got to make room for the gifts of others. We've got to see and identify and recruit. And when you see something good in someone, don't just think it, say it. When you vocalize it, it activates something. But there's something inside of each of us that is voice activated that when someone says it, it comes alive. It's parakaleo. It's encouragement. That's what it looks like. So, Last, and I'm getting ready to close, is we want to make room for the Lord. We want to make room for people. We want to make room for people's gifts. But last, we got to make room for the impossible. And, and that's faith. That's to believe that, that God can do what no man can do. To know that, that he can do things that are beyond our wildest imaginations. Can, can you imagine as we read the New Testament text, if these people would not have made room for the impossible, imagine if the leper had not made room for the impossible, if he hadn't approached Jesus and asked him to heal him because he was, he was hopeless at that point, but yet he made room for the impossible. Imagine the paralytic we just read about, like if, if they had not made room, if they had not tore off the roof and let him down for an impossible thing to take place. Can you imagine the woman with the issue of blood that presses through the crowd and she was unclean ceremony, she shouldn't have been touching people, but, but yet she knew she just had to get to Jesus, and she made room for the impossible in her life. Imagine Jairus, whose daughter was dying, dying a, a leader of the synagogue, a religious man who had position. If he had not made room for the impossible by losing his dignity and getting on his face before Jesus, his daughter would not have been raised. Imagine the centurion who says, just speak the word. If he had not made room for the impossible, his servant would not have been raised from the dead or from the sick bed. Imagine if the blind man that Jesus led outside of the city, leaving all he had never known. Notice Jesus didn't heal him and then lead him out. He led him out and then he healed him. Sometimes you have to walk in the darkness and not know what the next step is, but you have to trust Jesus and know that on the other side, he's got something good for you and for his glory. 
I want us as a church to make room for the impossible. So as I'm summing all this up, that means this. Making room for the impossible means stop allowing religion to talk you out of what God wants to do. Just make room. Say, God, I'm open. So, so landing this, what does it look like for our church? What am I speaking into the culture? What am I calling us to moving forward? I told you today is not just a strategy session. Today is about speaking to the heart of our church. And I'm going to say this. There are three words I want to give you. They don't all have the same letter. I'm sorry. I tried. The first one is hunger, that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness, that we would hunger for the heart of the Lord, that we would understand we do not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that we would be hungry for his presence and hungry for his heart and his will, and that there would be something inside of us that we would not let apathy set up inside of us, that we would be a hungry people. Number two is humility. And I think this one is perhaps the most important right now. A humility that even, even my hermeneutic is, is a humble hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is just a fancy word that says how I interpret scripture. That I would approach scripture with reverence and awe and humility to know that I am limited in my scope and I am sub, and I'm totally, totally given to a subjective reading when I read my own interpretation into it and I am so given to lean into it and read it and base it out of my own experiences and my background and what I've been taught but rather approach it and say God I know that I bring this lens to the text but would you please help me find your truth humble ourselves humble ourselves in our attitudes toward each other in the church humble ourselves toward who we are and what we're doing and what God's called us to do that I'm not entitled to anything but but just be humble and say God I just I want to serve you and serve others and make a difference it, this is the thing if humble hearts are not easily offended hearts and the third is this to be a loving church to be a loving church that we would be the most loving church anyone has ever encountered and can I tell you this you already do this I'm reinforcing what you already are. Because vision is like air in a tire, it leaks. Especially when seasons change, it leaks a little more. And we're in a shifting season as a church and I don't want us to lose who we are in the sense that yes, we make room for God and, and we're hungry, we worship and we're passionate and we go after the Lord and, but we're also humble and we understand that, that, that we don't know everything and we're open to God teaching us but then, but we are a loving church. I, I got a story sent to me the other day from someone on Facebook Messenger. It was a, a girl that had been struggling with addiction for years, had lost her daughter. She was started coming to Gateway Church and she says, Pastor Jason, I can remember coming in there and right in the middle of withdrawals and I'm, I'm detoxing and I'm, 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 I'm sweating and I, I, but I would get into church and it would go away. And I would just feel God's presence and his love and I, and I felt the love by the people. I never felt judged, I never felt condemned and, and I just kept coming back and I just kept coming back and I just kept coming back and, and today she has a great job. She has her daughter back and she's serving God and she loves the Lord. But can I tell you, it's because you made room for her because you loved her right where she was. And if we are ever not that church, I will not be the pastor because we will be a church that loves people well. This is not a museum of morality. This is a hospital for the hurting that the broken can come into. So we're gonna do this. We're gonna, we're gonna do two things. The first, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and stand to your feet. And, and I want to ask you the most important question I ever asked. You say, well, you just, you shared some vision, but like, but like, what does that mean? Understand, I shared vision to give you a picture. Strategy is going to be unpacked in the coming months. What it looks like, how we're going to do it, how we're going to accomplish it. But this is the thing. I'm asking you today, first and foremost, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today's the day. Or maybe you've known him and you've grown distant and disconnected. Maybe the church has hurt you. Maybe religion. Maybe I've hurt you. If I have, I am so sorry. But don't let my failure as a leader or a pastor to cause you to look negatively on the beauty of Jesus who loves you immensely and laid down his life for you. 
So in spite of me and in spite of maybe the church or in spite of church leaders, that you would find Jesus today. And if you would say today, if you would just bow your heads for a second, if you would say today, Pastor Jason, I want to be saved. Or, or maybe I've known him and I've grown distant. I want to come home. I want to be restored. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? Thank you so much. Somebody else, I want to be saved. Thank you. Praise God, man. Can we praise God for those hands that just went up? Like, thank you, Lord. My second question is this. If you would say, Jesus, I want to be hungry. I want to be humble. And I want to be loving. I want to make room for you, Lord. I want to make room for other people. I want to make room for people's gifts in my life. But I also want to make room for the impossible. If you would say, Pastor, I'm on board with you. Would you just throw your hand just as a sign to say that? I'm with you. Let's go. I'm with you. Let's go. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to do this. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, normally it's time to go. But I see to do one more thing at that point. But let's pray first. If you would say this with me. Say, King Jesus, thank you for saving me. I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. And I commit, Lord, to follow you all the days of my life. I'll never be the same. Keep me hungry. Keep me humble. Keep me loving. Help me to make room for you, to make room for others, for their gifts, and for the impossible. I trust you, Jesus. Help us as we move forward. In Jesus' name. Come on, can we give him praise again for how good and faithful he is? Here in just a second, here in just a second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dismiss you. You can go, if you need to go, you can go. If you wanna stay in worship, you can stay in worship. If you want a prayer, we have a prayer team that would love to pray with you. If you gave your life to Jesus, and it's not, it is personal, but it's not private, we'd love for you to tell somebody, and we wanna come alongside you to walk with you in your faith journey. But part of today too, part of the heart of this is to say we're in this together. This is that Sunday. We don't do this, we've actually never done this. This is the first time we've done this. And we wanna put a QR code up on the screen. If you have your phone and you say, I'm, re I'm ready to commit. This is my home, I wanna do this. We have it up on the screen, we have it out at the connect table or you get a connect card. Membership is not like joining a gym. Understand me, it's not like joining a gym. This is it's called covenant membership because we need to know like who is locking arms and it's a way just to commit. How many know when you go into a marriage, you go into a marriage with commitment, amen? How, how many knows when you go into a, a business venture, you go into it with commitment? We're just saying this is an opportunity to say, I wanna make the commitment to move forward. If you wanna open your phone, you can do it with that or if you wanna stop at the connect table, you can do it there. But regardless, we wanna give you the opportunity. People ask me all the time, how do we do this? How do we do this? And we don't push it a lot because in my heart, if you're committed and you're here, that's great. But we want to give you the opportunity to do that. But more than anything, we want you, as you leave this place, to know you're going as a witness of Christ. And whatever place you find yourself, whatever situation you find yourself in, let's bear witness and make much of Jesus, okay? So I'm going to pray for you, and then you can go. Lord, go with them as they go, as they shine light into the darkness. Bless them and keep them, Lord. Go before them. Let your church be a faithful witness of you in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen, amen. Can we give him praise before we go? God bless you all. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever.